All right, I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to all the things I'm going to learn this week. We live in a quantum world, yet we are classical beings, and sometimes our quantum nature impedes our ability to interact with, learn from, and understand the underlying quantum reality. And I want to talk about two ways in which we can improve our ability to learn about the quantum world, which I'll call learning using classical machines and learning using quantum machines. I'm particularly interested in many qubit quantum states, which have the capacity to become profoundly entangled. And it's possible to transform a many qubit quantum state into a succinct classical description of the state. In doing so, we discard a vast amount of information, but we can still retain much physically relevant information about the state, and then generalize from that classical data to make predictions about quantum systems that we haven't encountered in the lab before, and learn to recognize quantum phases of matter that we haven't seen before. With quantum machines, we can go further. If we can transduce quantum data that we encounter to a quantum memory and then process it with a quantum computer, then in some cases we can achieve an exponential advantage over classical processing of measurement data. That is, we can learn properties with exponentially fewer, exponential in the system size, experiments if we make use of quantum memory and processing which can allow us to perceive aspects of nature that would otherwise be deeply hidden. It's possible in principle to have a complete classical description of a many qubit quantum state, but it's not at all practical to do so because that description involves an exponentially large amount of classical data and it takes an exponential number of experiments to learn that description and an exponential amount of classical processing to use that description to predict properties of interest of the state. There's a beautiful idea called shadow tomography, which takes the point of view that we don't really need a complete description. We may be satisfied to be able to predict accurately many properties of the state, like the expectation values of many observables, and using shadow tomography, we can predict the values of many observables with access to a number of copies of the state, which is just linear in the system size and polylogarithmic in the number of properties that we want to predict. But shadow tomography, too, is not a practical protocol because it requires that we do entangling measurements across multiple copies of the state which require circuits of exponential size, quantum circuits of exponential size, to execute. In the last couple of years, we've been developing the idea of classical shadows of quantum states, especially with my amazing collaborators, Robert Huang and Richard Kuhn. Classical shadows, though not so powerful as full-blown classical shadows, are far more practical with a relatively small number of experimentally feasible measurements, we can learn a succinct classical description of a many qubit quantum state. And then doing efficient classical processing, use that description to predict a large number of properties. And furthermore, we have rigorous guarantees that our predictions are accurate with high probability. Examples of properties that we can predict more efficiently using the classical shadow method compared to previous protocols are fidelity with target states, entanglement measures, entropic quantities, viewpoint correlation functions, expectation values of local observables and local Hamiltonians, and many others. So how does it work? Well, let's imagine that we have access to multiple identically prepared copies of some unknown quantum state that we want to learn about. Those might have been prepared by a quantum computer or a quantum simulator or some other laboratory method. And then we will make randomized measurements of the copies one at a time. 
The protocol is defined by an ensemble of unitary transformations where if we want the protocol to be experimentally practical, each one of those unitary should be ones that we really can perform in the lab and which also admit a succinct classical description. And so for each copy of the quantum state that we are able to access, we randomly select some unitary transformation from that ensemble and apply it to the unknown quantum state, and then we measure it in the computational basis. And by applying the inverse of that unitary to the computational basis state yielded by that measurement, uh, we get a snapshot of the state. And if we average the snapshots over the choice of unitary and the measurement outcome, that defines a quantum channel, a completely positive trace-preserving map acting on the input density operator. So just to illustrate the idea with a concrete example, suppose it's a state of a single qubit, a pure state that resides in the XZ plane of the block sphere. And we can decide uniformly at random to either measure the poly operator Z, getting the outcome 0 or 1, or the poly operator X, getting the outcomes plus or minus. And if we average over the choice of measurement and the measurement outcomes, the result is a depolarizing channel, which preserves the input state with a probability of one-third and replaces it by a maximally mixed state with probability two-thirds. So we repeat this procedure many times as defined by our ensemble of unitaries and we obtain many of these snapshots. Now if the measurements that we are sampling from are tomographically complete, then the channel, the map defined by the protocol is an invertible linear transformation. Its inverse is not a physical operation that we can actually perform in the lab, but it doesn't need to be because we're not going to actually execute it in the lab, we're going to apply it to classical data that we've stored in a classical memory. And then if we apply the inverse of the channel to all of our snapshots, then the expectation value of those inverted snapshots is just the input density operator defined by the protocol. So or that was received by the protocol. So if I want to estimate the expectation value of some observable, particularly if it's one that I can describe succinctly classically, I can calculate the expectation value for each one of these inverted snapshots, and then by averaging over the choice of measurement and the measurement outcomes, I obtain an unbiased estimator for that property of the density operator. But how good is that estimate? Uh, how accurate is it if I have a finite number of snapshots? Well, the fundamental theorem about classical shadows includes two statements. First of all, there's an upper bound on the variance of the estimator. And secondly, there's a statement that large deviations compared to that variance from mean values are exponentially rare. So that means I can take a total of capital N inverted snapshots and I can, with high success probability, accurately predict a number of expectation values which is exponential in that number of snapshots, the number of states that I measured. The upper bound on the variance involves something we call the shadow norm. And its general form is not particularly illuminating, but there are special cases in which it does have a simple and useful form. One such special case is random Clifford measurement. That means we uniformly at random apply to the state an element of the Clifford group. All of those elements can be described succinctly classically, and then we measure in the computational basis. And in the case of random Clifford measurement, the shadow norm is essentially the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the observable, the X the trace of uh, its square. An example of an operator whose Hilbert-Schmidt norm is a constant independent of system size is the projection onto some pure state. So in this case, uh, what we're saying 
is that if we collect uh, capital N inverted snapshots, then using those and with classical processing, we can predict the fidelity of the input state with a number of pure states, which is exponential in the number of samples that we measured. And if each one of those pure states can be described succinctly classically, then we can do so with efficient classical processing. Another case in which the shadow norm has a simple form is random poly measurement. That means that for each one of the qubits, we decide uh, uniformly at random to measure the poly operator x, y, or z. And in that case, the shadow norm is simply related to the spectral norm, to the maximum eigenvalue of the observable. But it also has an exponential dependence on the weight of the operator, the number of qubits on which the operator acts non-trivially. So for example, uh, let's suppose we're interested in the expectation value of a local Hamiltonian. It's a sum of terms, each of which has constant weight. The total number of terms is polynomial in N. And then with um, a number of shadows, which is a number of snapshots, which is logarithmic in the system size, we can get a good estimate of the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So I've described a local and a global shadow protocol. The local protocol is randomized poly measurement. We measure the qubits one at a time. That's something that's feasible to do with platforms that we have today. And using that data, we can predict expectation values of local observables efficiently. I also described a global protocol, random Clifford measurement, where the Clifford transformations are globally scrambling operations acting on the input state. That requires a quantum circuit which has a depth which grows nearly linearly with the system size. So for large n, that's not something that's easy to do with existing platforms. But if we can do it, then we can get access to some global properties of the state which are not accessible to the local protocol. And we can also envision interpolating between these two extremes by applying some constant depth scrambling circuit to the input state and then measuring in the computational basis. And as the depth of that circuit increases, we get access to operators of increasing weight, but the task of classically inverting the channel, the channel defined by the shadow protocol becomes increasingly complex. This method is nicely robust with respect to noise. It's a welcome feature that the randomization in the protocol simplifies the noise, mapping it to a poly noise channel, which can be characterized relatively cheaply. And once the noise is characterized, we can include it in our channel inversion to obtain an unbiased estimator of the state. So of course, the sampling error in our determination of that polychannel will contribute to the variance of that estimator. In a recent review, we distilled the philosophy of such randomized measurement protocols to an aphorism. You don't need to know at the time that you measure the samples what target properties you're going to be interested in. So you can measure first and ask questions later. And in fact, Many of the applications of classical shadows the last few years have involved reanalyzing data taken in quantum experiments where originally there was a different purpose in mind. Just as an illustration, here's an example based on data taken in an, an experiment by the Innsbruck group a couple of years ago using 20 qubits in an ion trap. They were interested in studying the low energy spectrum of one dimensional quantum electrodynamics. Uh, you can view that as a system of n qubits where the number of terms in the Hamiltonian is quadratic in n. They used a variational method to prepare low energy states, but they didn't just measure the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, they also estimated the variance of the Hamiltonian to validate that they had actually found approximate eigenstates. Ideally, in an energy eigenstate, the variance of the Hamiltonian would be zero. 
And that means they had to estimate the expectation value of the square of the Hamiltonian, which has of order n to the fourth terms, a lot of terms, when n is equal to 20. And they used a customized protocol for measuring all those terms, which required a number of experiments, a number of samples, which grew linearly with the system size, but with classical shadows, uh, we can improve that to logarithmic dependence on the system size, a big advantage when the system is large. So now that we've seen that it's possible to translate a many qubit quantum system to succinct classical data while retaining the ability to predict many properties of the state, it's natural to ask whether we can use classical algorithms to attack quantum problems where the input to the problem is such a classical description of classical shadow. And there has been a lot of interest the last couple of years in using classical machine learning methods to study problems in quantum many body physics. Most of that work is heuristic and it's interesting to ask whether it's possible to, in some cases, give a rigorous guarantee that the classical ML gives reliable results. And we found that it is possible uh, to make such a rigorous guarantee in a couple of settings. One is the setting of learning properties of ground states of local Hamiltonians. So let's consider some family of Hamiltonians, which are smoothly parametrized by some set, set of real parameters. And let's suppose that for values of those parameters, which we choose to sample, we can get access to the corresponding ground state of the Hamiltonian. And then for each one of those ground states, we can convert it to a classical shadow and try to generalize those classical shadows to new values of x different than the ones encountered during training. And we showed that for local gapped Hamiltonians, that can be done efficiently, that the amount of training data needed and the computation time both scale reasonably with the system size and with the dimension of the parameter space. So the learning is entirely classical. We could make use of our quantum platform to prepare the quantum states of interest and convert them to classical shadows. And then we use a classical machine learning method to generalize. And at least for gap local Hamiltonians, we can show that that generalization is reliable. That when we have access to training data, in fact, in some cases, we can solve quantum problems that would be too hard to solve if we didn't have access to any data. We did a number of numerical experiments to validate these classical machine learning methods. Uh, here's one example inspired by an experiment done by the Harvard group a few years ago in which they studied the properties of a chain of 51 Rydberg atoms. We can just think of this as a system of qubits where there's a term in the Hamiltonian that favors the qubit being in the state one instead of the state zero. Uh, but also a term which penalizes qubits that are both in the state one, which are in close proximity to one another. And the competition between those two effects results in an interesting phase diagram shown here on the left with different phases separated by first order phase transitions. So using DMRG, we can find essentially uh, exact wave functions for the system and then we can simulate the conversion to classical shadows and the application of machine learning methods to generalize those classical shadows. Uh, that's one of the numerical experiments we did. Uh, we sampled this parameter space at the value shown by gray circles and then used that data to predict properties of the ground state for other points in the parameter space like this diamond star and cross. We can use this method to predict any local property we please, but suppose we're interested in the expectation value of poly operator Z for each one of the 51 sites, then the exact result from the DMRG calculation is shown by the pink line. The results from the classical ML generalizing from the training set are shown by the triangles. 
and they agree pretty well. In fact, for this case, our theorem does not guarantee that the prediction will be accurate. It applies to the case where the training data and the predictions are both in the same quantum phase of matter, which isn't the case here because we're sampling from several different phases, but nevertheless, the predictions work pretty well. Another setting we can consider is classifying quantum phases of matter. So let's suppose that there are two different phases of quantum matter, call them A and B, and during training we are presented with samples from the two phases, labeled A or B, and we measure those one at a time, however we like, and then we are presented with states which don't carry labels, which are drawn from either phase A or phase B, and we want to predict which phase they came from. So again, we use the strategy of taking each one of those states and converting it to its classical shadow, and then the task becomes one of classifying the classical shadows. And we can show under a physically motivated assumption that uh, that can be done efficiently, that the amount of training data and classical computation time that's needed to predict accurately both scale polynomially with the total size of the system. The learning strategy is a standard one in learning theory. We map the classical shadow to a high dimensional feature space and then we try to learn a linear classifying function in that feature space. The assumption that we needed was that there's some nonlinear function of the local density operators in the system that can be used to identify the phases. That's a reasonable assumption for gap phases of matter because we expect the phase to be revealed by a chunk of bulk matter which is comparable in size to the correlation length independent of the total size of the system. The classifying function is assumed to exist but it's not known to the classical ML, it is discovered by the machine learning algorithm and that can provide guidance to physicists for understanding the features that distinguish the two different phases. So here too we did a number of numerical experiments of which I'll show you one. In this case the task is to distinguish between a topological phase and a trivial phase of two dimensional matter. The defining property of a topological phase is that if we start with an unentangled product state and want to produce a state in the topological phase using a geometrically local quantum circuit, then the depth of that circuit has to grow with the system size. So what we've done here is we considered two representatives of a topological phase and a trivial phase, Kataev's Toric code with a, a distance 10 realization of the code and a product state. And then we applied random local circuits uh, to those uh, representative states to obtain other representatives of the phase which were harder to recognize. What's shown here is the result of applying a depth three random circuit to the toric code states and to the product state. And then we take the classical shadows, we map them to the high dimensional feature space and then project that down to its two principal axes, those that give the highest variance for the data. And we can see, oops. that the two phases can be very easily distinguished. In this case, there was no uh, label training data at all. The learning was unsupervised, but the distinction between the two phases is sufficiently robust that label training data is not needed to distinguish the two phases well. Shown on the right is a one-dimensional representation of the data, just showing one uh, principal axis. Um, you can see how the data clusters as we increase the size of the random circuit applied to the trivial state and to the toric code state. And until that random circuit reaches a depth of five, which is half the distance of the toric code, uh, 
we continue to be able to distinguish the two phases well. So in the few minutes I have left, I want to say something about how if we can do quantum processing of quantum data rather than classical processing of classical shadows, we can in some cases have a big advantage in learning properties of the state that many fewer experiments may be required. So again, I want to consider a situation in which I have access to multiple identically prepared copies of an unknown state. And then we distinguish two different ways of learning about the state. In the conventional setting, we measure the copies one at a time, however we like. We store all that data, and then we use that classical data and classical processing to make our predictions. That's what we've been considering up until now. And in fact, those measurements can be adaptive. So the measurement that we perform on each copy can be conditioned on the outcomes of measurements that were performed in earlier rounds. Contrast that with the quantum enhanced setting in which we take quantum data and transduce it to a quantum memory. So we have multiple copies of the data stored in a quantum memory. And then we process it using a quantum computer and eventually make measurements from which we extract our predictions. And we can prove that in some cases, the quantum enhanced setting has an exponential advantage. The number of experiments that are needed to learn properties of interest are exponentially fewer in the system size if we make use of quantum memory and quantum processing. And that theorem applies to ideal quantum processing, but in fact, the quantum processing that's needed to achieve that advantage is so simple, it can actually be carried out in existing platforms where we were able to do a proof of concept experiment using up to 40 qubits of the Google Sycamore processor. So on the lower left here is data from one of the experiments that we did. The horizontal axis is the size of the system. Uh, up to 20 qubits. That was the maximum because we wanted to be able to store two copies of the state using 40 qubits of Sycamore. And the particular thing that we uh, did here is that in the conventional scenario, the copies were measured one at a time. In the quantum enhanced scenario, two copies were stored and an entangling bell measurement was used across the copies. And after all the measurements were performed, Observables were revealed from an exponentially large list that we wanted to estimate. In fact, the quantum state that was unknown in this experiment is a separable state, which is easy to prepare on the quantum platform. And then after the experiments are performed, two high-weight poly operators are declared, and the task is just to determine which one of those has a higher expectation value. So in the ideal case, the number of experiments that we need to answer that question with good success probability uh, would be constant, independent of system size. In the experiment, the results are shown as the uh, blue diamonds, and it increases slowly. But by the time we got up to the largest system size that we considered, which was 20, we had two, 20 cube, two copies of the 20 qubit state stored in our processor the number of experiments was already below a rigorous lower bound on what would be needed in the conventional scenario uh, to answer the same question by about a three orders of magnitude. And we also performed measurements in the conventional scenario, but we weren't able to go beyond a system size of eight uh, because the number of experiments needed was infeasibly large. So this um, could be seen as encouraging us to anticipate that future quantum sensing networks by gathering quantum data in quantum memory and then processing it quantumly may be able to get access to properties which we couldn't otherwise see. All right, so I better sum up. I told you about classical shadows of quantum states. 
That's a feasible procedure for converting a quantum state to a succinct classical description of the state from which we can predict many properties with of order log capital M copies of the state and efficient classical processing. We can predict capital M properties. And we don't need to know what the target properties are at the time we measure the samples. We can measure first and ask questions later. I indicated how access to data from quantum experiments can enable classical machine learning to efficiently solve quantum problems, including ones that would be too hard to solve without access to the data. And I described how quantum enhanced experiments, which make use of quantum memory and quantum processing, can have an exponential advantage relative to conventional experiments. Well, that last result may be a hint that if a future multi-qubit quantum sensor can get access to repeated copies of quantum data, it may be able to see signals that would be impossible to see by more conventional means. In any case, we hope that our results will encourage some fresh thinking about where to seek advantage using quantum technology. Well, thank you for listening. When you apply the random unitaries to your state and then do the measurement, mm -hmm. how like deep, uh, you know, you're, you're performing some two qubit gates. How deep do those two qubit gates have to be to get a, you know, the proper random unitary? Well, it depends on which version of the protocol we're talking about. Okay. But the one that I called random poly measurement, depth one. You measure each one of the qubits in a randomly chosen poly basis. No two qubit gates in that case. But in general, do you need to? Well, it depends. If for the Clifford protocol, uh, where, where we can get access to global properties, uh, the depth is, uh, scales essentially like the system size. Okay. So it would be hard to do with 50 qubits. Yeah. Like general conceptual question. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I was trained by a um, uh, senior so post-Soviet scientist. And we would solve problems. Um, we'd have different approach to compute the result. I was already a generation which had um, access to calculators. But the senior professor, he had uh, a different approach. He go to the shelf and he had like a collection of books. And what those books were is they were uh, tables of all say possible logarithms. And he took this book, you know, he needed logarithm, he looked at this book and find the, found the uh, correct number in it. Uh, do you see this um, future of this technology is kind of, kind of this book? So while we don't have access, like widespread access to quantum computing, is it possible that some universities or companies that have access to huge devices and experiments can create a database of these classical shadows for many relevant scenarios such that anybody can go and using classic computer as, as this professor can go to the, uh, to the uh, bookshelf and find the results they need. And even if using the machine learning can I also find like results which are not in the this is a book, but somewhere in between two values using kind of machine learning. Is that, do you think it's where we, we go? Yeah, I think that's happening now. I mean, people uh, who have done these kinds of randomized measurements have uh, stored and shared their data, and you know, other people have been able to analyze that to predict other properties uh, in addition to those that uh, the experimenters had in mind when they made the measurements. Now, another question that you might be hinting at is, let's say in that library, I have uh, lots of books that, you know, like the handbooks that give properties of many different chemical compounds, and people are interested in using classical machine learning to generalize from that data to predict properties of other compounds, including ones that haven't yet been synthesized. And our results don't guarantee you can do that because I don't know how to translate the data in the handbook into something like the classical shadow protocol. 
Um, and so we don't, so any ideas about that currently are heuristic, but I think we can envision being able to make use of such data in a way that uh, allows us to get some rigorous guarantees about generalizing from the data in the handbooks. Let's see, there are a few questions in the back, maybe Holly, you can run the, or maybe you can run the. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. And also, I think uh, classical shadows are a beautiful idea, like, using these random measurements to reconstruct the density matrix. Um, but they're not the only way of using random measurements to um, measure these observables. For example, if you are interested in Rennie entropies, there are other ways of using randomized measurements to measure Rennie entropies. If you want to measure like a Hamiltonian that has polynomial, man polynomial many local terms, you could just like measure in random poly bases and then see like which terms in the Hamiltonian are diagonal in the like in the bases that you've chosen to measure in and then just like sample those terms, sum them together and take the weighted sum without ever reconstructing the density matrix. Uh, so I was wondering if you could say more about how classical shadows compares to other ways of using randomized measurements to estimate these observables. Oh uh, yeah, well of course you're right. Uh, there's a large uh, family of randomized measurement uh, protocols of which uh, classical shadows is a special case and um, it's good that you reminded people that uh, in fact such methods were being used uh, before our work to you know learn interesting properties of many copy states. Uh, our motivation to begin with at least was to try to get rigorous guarantees. And so, you know, our focus has been on uh, what are the conditions under which we can prove something about uh, the reliability of the predictions. Um, and uh, there are uh, ways of making them, uh, making the predictions more efficient for special cases, in which ca in cases in which you don't um, measure first and then ask questions later, but actually customize the randomized measurements for a particular task. And that can outperform the, you know, randomized standard uh, classical shadow protocol. So uh, my question is about the, uh, this topological versus uh, trivial state. So it's kind of tempting to, uh, assume that the machine is actually learning the string operators? Because it was Torico, right? So um, my question is that, is it possible uh, to kind of open up and see what the machine has learned? And then second, um, is it possible to distinguish between two different topological states? Because it might be easy to distinguish between trivial and topological, but in two topological, I have to learn like the corresponding, let's say, uh, string operators. All right, well, I think there's more going on than learning string operators. And in fact, for topological phases as I define them, uh, there does not exist an observable whose expectation value identifies the phases. If you have a string operator, for example, and you apply a random circuit to it, you can scramble its value. And, uh, you know, it can't be used to distinguish the trivial from the uh, non-trivial phase. So it's learning um, polynomial functions of the density operator. I didn't emphasize it, but we can use classical shadows for that as well. Um, Renyi entropies are an example. We can think of learning a polynomial function of the density operator as learning expectation values of some observable acting on multiple copies of the state. And um, so it might be learning things like, uh, you know, topological entanglement entropy, some nonlinear property which could, in principle, distinguish different topological phases. I had a follow-up question to that, actually. So the number of um, copies of the system that you need in order for the classical machine learning to learn a given phase probably tells you something about the observable that the uh, 
that's being learned. Is that correct? Because the shadow norm changes. Yeah, but in principle, we know more because uh -huh. the uh, we actually um, the classical ML tells us what the function is. Now, whether it's easy for humans to interpret that function is is another question. But um, of course, that's a, a good challenge for the theorists. Um, so, so for some quantum states, it's uh, easier to learn their property. For example, if I have a free theory, um, then two-point function determines other correlation functions. So I'm wondering in the, whether in the classical shadow, uh, whether there is a way to learn or try to use the machine to guess um, such kind of uh, status specific properties which help us to speed up the um, prediction. Right, so the, uh, the statements about the number of expectation values we can learn, uh, you know, related to the shadow norm, they all apply for any input density operator. For the generalization uh, achieved by classical ML, you know, some assumptions were needed to show that the generalization can be uh, done efficiently. Um, so I think well, the kind of thing you're suggesting is that higher point correlation functions could be determined in some way by lower point correlation functions, free theories being a particular instance of that. And uh, would the uh, protocols uh, identify that property or that that property is uh, approximately applicable? Um, maybe for, for the randomized poly, uh, measurements, uh, you know, as we are trying to access uh, operators of higher weight, uh, you know, we do need more copies. But, you know, we might see uh, as we increase uh, the number of samples and do get access to uh, higher point correlation functions that they have some approximate functional dependence on, on lower ones. I haven't thought specifically about how you would learn whether that's the case, but it's, you know, it seems reasonable that you could. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering whether you've worked on or thought about um, how, or how to distinguish maybe gapless critical states using uh, these protocols and how the circuit depth would scale in a situation like that. So you're asking about the, uh, what we know about the performance of classical machine learning in the case of uh, systems that are not gapped. Yeah, so for our um, statement about learning properties of ground states, uh, we made use of the uh, fact that the phases were gapped and had a finite um, spatial dimensionality uh, in order to have nice smoothness properties of how the ground state uh, depended on um, the parameters. And um, at least the methods that we use to establish that uh, don't apply to the gapless case. I don't think that means that, that it's hopeless, um, but it would require some more sophisticated way of controlling the variation in the parameter space of ground state properties than we came up with. Oh, can I ask a question on this? Uh, so the way that tensor network representation kind of give rise to a numerical simulation algorithm, do you think this shadow tomography can kind of like hint at a, as a, I don't know, classical simulation strategy? Or quantum systems. Uh, so say that again. You said something about a tensor so network it, yeah, representation. Yeah, like tensor network representation kind of give rise to the idea of like some, some sort of like numerical algorithm for simulation of quantum systems. I was wondering if this, this classical shadow tomography can also be used to come up with the algorithm to sim like classically simulate some quantum systems. And yeah. Um, so I guess your question is, can we leverage classical shadows to develop tensor network methods that give more accurate approximations than? I mean, not necessarily tensor network. I just mentioned tensor network to just hint at, I mean, 
Tensor network can be seen as a classical representation of quantum states, and then you, you can use that to basically run simulations, like n numerical classical simulations. Right. I was wondering if like, you can use classical shadows to come up with maybe a completely different classical algorithm to simulate quantum systems. Well, one question you could ask, and I don't have a good answer to it, uh, is um, with tensor networks, we can do simulations of dynamics under suitable conditions, namely that the state doesn't become too highly entangled so that the bond dimension doesn't uh, blow up. And uh, so suppose we have a classical shadow and we'd like to evolve the state and have some guarantee that after some finite time, we, the updated state has, um, is a good approximation to the exact updated state. And um, at least for sufficiently short times, that ought to be possible. But we don't have very um, sharp results like that. I think it's a good thing to think about. And one last question. Uh, one? Oh, okay. nope. Hello. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Uh, so thank you for your talk. Um, you talked about these three different variants of the classical shadow procedure, the local, global, and then the sort of in-between method. I was wondering if you could elaborate on sort of the domain of applicability for the in-between methods. Say, for instance, you wanted to get like a von Neumann entropy for the whole system or something like this. Do you have to use these Clifford measurements or can you use uh, something with a little bit lighter of a footprint? Right. Um, so uh, there are good reasons to think about that in particular because for some platforms, uh, you know, you don't have the single qubit control to do random poly measurement um, in Rydberg atom systems, for example. But uh, you do have um, parameter regimes in which the dynamics is chaotic. And so you could just let the system evolve under its natural Hamiltonian for some short time and then measure. And then it is possible to, you know, prove certain guarantees about uh, how well you can then reconstruct local operators in situations like that. Here, you want to put this on? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you, John, again for a nice talk.